Hi, Muslims claim that Muhammad was a true prophet. Therefore, he always obeyed Allah's commands in the Quran. In this video, I will refute that claim. In Islamic law, there is a well-known principle which states that if something is forbidden, then that which leads to it is also forbidden. Here's a quote from a world-famous Islamic scholar, Yusuf al-Qaradawi. In his book, The Lawful and the Prohibited in Islam, he says in chapter 1, Another Islamic principle is that if something is prohibited, anything which leads to it is likewise prohibited. By this means, Islam intends to block all avenues leading to what is haram or forbidden. For example, as Islam has prohibited sex outside marriage, it has also prohibited anything which leads to it or makes it attractive, such as seductive clothing, private meetings, and casual mixing between men and women, the depiction of nudity, pornographic literature, obscene songs, and so on. So what happens when we review the Islamic sources and apply this Islamic legal principle to Muhammad? Well, let me show you. In Quran chapter 2 verse 222, we see Allah orders Muhammad and all Muslim men to avoid sexual activity with their wives during their menstruation. Quote, They ask you concerning menstruation, say that is a harmful thing. Therefore, keep away from women during menses. And go not unto them till they have purified. And when they have purified themselves, then go in unto them as Allah has ordained for you. Truly, Allah loves those who turn unto Him in repentance and loves those who purify themselves. Notice here, the Qur'an's prohibition is very general and not specific or limited to any one particular kind of sexual act. So the question arises, did Muhammad obey that prohibition? We find the shocking answer in the Hadith literature. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 1, Hadith number 300, under the chapter, Fondling a Menstruating Wife, we read, Aisha, Muhammad's nine-year-old child bride said, And he, meaning Muhammad, used to order me to put on an izar, or a waist wrap, and he used to fondle me while I used to be in my periods, or menses. Pay attention to the Arabic here. The translator, Mr. Muhsin Khan, translates fayubashiruni as he used to fondle me. This Arabic verb comes from the root bashara. And in Muhammad's defense, Muslims like to point out it simply means skin touching skin or to contact or touch. The problem is, it also means to have sexual intercourse, as you see in this dictionary. But that would indicate Muhammad disobeyed Allah's prohibition in Quran chapter 2 verse 222. So how do we solve this translation problem? Was Muhammad simply erotically stroking or fondling little Aisha, as Muslims would like us to believe, or was there something more serious and nasty going on? To answer that, we must take another look at that Arabic verb, bashara. Instead of relying upon dictionaries or upon biased Muslim translators like Mr. Muhsin Khan, let's turn our attention to the Arabic of the Quran itself. We find the same verb correctly and accurately used in Quran chapter 2 verse 187. The context here is about Allah abrogating a previous order which prohibited sexual intercourse during the nighttime in the month of Ramadan. It is made lawful for you to have sexual relations with your wives on the night of the fasts. They are garments for you and you are the same for them. Allah knows that you used to deceive yourselves so he turned to you and forgave you. So now have sexual relations with them and seek that which Allah has ordained for you and eat and drink until the white thread of dawn appears to you distinct from the black thread. Then complete your fast till the nightfall and do not have sexual relations with them while you confine in the mosques. These are the limits set by Allah so approach them not. Thus does Allah make clear his signs to mankind that they may become pious. The verb bashara is being used here where the verse says which means, so now have sexual relations with them, 
And again where it says, وَلَا تُبَاشِرُهُنَّ Which means, and do not have sexual relations with them. There should be no disagreement here. The context clearly indicates the verb is referring to sexual intercourse. But if you disagree, then I turn your attention to the authoritative commentaries on the Qur'an, such as Tafsirul Jalalain, as you see here. For proof, it means sexual intercourse. Therefore, by using the Qur'an as our evidence, the correct understanding of the hadith is that Aisha claimed Muhammad used to have sexual intercourse with her while she was menstruating. And that forces us to conclude Muhammad disobeyed the Qur'an's prohibition in chapter 2, verse 222. But wait, the Muslims have another defense. They claim the hadith gives no indication that Muhammad acted against the Qur'an's prohibition because the very wording of the hadith, that he ordered his wife to tie a waist wrap on her body, indicates that he did not have sexual intercourse with her during her period. He simply embraced her. Well, I've already refuted the Muslims on a linguistic level, so here I will respond simply by using some common sense and logic. The fact that he ordered his wife to tie a waist wrap around her body actually supports my claim more than it supports the Muslim claim. Obviously, sexual intercourse in such a situation must be a terribly messy experience. So the waist wrap would be needed to clean up the menstrual blood. But I just can't blindly assume things. For my explanation to be valid, I must supplement it with supporting evidence, which would indicate that Muhammad personally didn't mind physically coming into contact with menstrual blood. So here's the evidence. In Sahih Muslim, Volume 1, Hadith number 296, Umm Salama reported, While I was laying down with the Messenger of Allah, meaning Muhammad, under a wool blanket, I menstruated. I slipped away and put on the dress I wore when menstruating. فَقَالَ لِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Messenger of Allah said to me, Has your menses started? قُلْتُ نَعَمْ I said yes. فَدَعَانِي فَضْطَجَعْتُ مَعَهُ فِي الْخَمِيلَ Then he called me and I lay down with him under the wool blanket. Notice how this hadith substantiates my explanation. Muhammad's physical intimacy in bed with Umm Salama during her menstruation indicates that physically coming into contact with menstrual blood didn't bother him. And if that didn't bother him, then sexual intercourse accompanied by menstrual blood would also not bother him. So, I have refuted the Muslims here thoroughly. But I would like to mention another point on this topic. Muhammad contradicted himself when he explicitly claimed he believed in the Torah of Moses, while on the other hand, he completely violates what the Torah teaches on this subject. Let me show you what I mean. In Sunan Abu Dawood, Volume 5, Hadith number 4449, we read, It was narrated that Ibn Umar said, Some of the Jews came and called the Messenger of Allah, meaning Muhammad, to Al-Quf, and he came to them in their school. They said, O oh, Abu Qasim, a man among us has committed zina, or fornication, with a woman, so pass judgment concerning them. They set out a cushion for the Messenger of Allah, and he sat on it. Then he said, I'tuni bit-Tawrat, bring me the Torah. It was brought, and he took the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it, and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Then he said, Bring me the most knowledgeable amongst you. And a young man was brought to him. And he mentioned the story of stoning as mentioned in the hadith of Malik from Nafi. And this hadith has been graded Hassan or reliable. So, Muhammad used to physically and even sexually come into contact with his menstruating wives yet he claimed to believe in the Torah. The problem is, the Torah teaches that men should not approach or touch women during their menstrual periods until they become clean. See Leviticus chapter 15 verse 24 and chapter 18 verse 19. So, Muslims have a serious dilemma here. Muhammad claimed to believe in the Torah, but as we have seen, he completely violated it. But for the Muslims, the most disturbing fact is, Muhammad disobeyed the Quran also. Now, I want to end this video by asking Muslims the following questions. Question number one. Why couldn't Muhammad control himself and obey the Quran in chapter 2 verse 222 where it prohibits Muslim men from 
having sexual activity with menstruating wives. Remember, Muhammad had multiple wives, plus female slaves, to fulfill his sexual needs, so you would assume, if he was a true prophet, he could have been patient and controlled himself for at least one night. He had so many other women to choose from who were not menstruating at any given time. Are we to conclude that Muhammad could not control and resist his sexual urges for his child bride Aisha, trying to find a way to be physically intimate with her even if it meant breaking Allah's prohibitions? And question number two, what was Muhammad trying to accomplish? Was he trying to teach particular men who, unlike Muhammad, only had one wife, that it's permissible to engage in sexual activity with her when she is menstruating? If so, that is still problematic. Remember the Islamic legal principle I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Even if a Muslim man didn't actually have sexual intercourse with his wife during her menses, he would still be violating the Islamic legal principle which states that if something is forbidden, in this case sexual intercourse during menstruation, then that which leads to that forbidden act, in this case sexual fondling or foreplay, is therefore also forbidden. Look, Muhammad's sex life is not my business. That's his own personal life and I really don't like talking about this. The problem is, he publicly claimed to be a prophet of God, yet hypocritically disobeyed the same God he claimed to receive divine revelation from. Now that's something I cannot be silent about. I hope you're not mad, and I hope you understand. Thank you for watching. God bless you.